Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to conclude my comments on the second reading of this uh, most important bill. I do so because best quality abortion care is enabled when abortion is a woman's decision, affordable to all and accessible regardless of a woman's location. In South Australia, abortion remains a crime punishable by up to life imprisonment. Where we once led, we now lag. It is time to again move forward. While each woman's experience of abortion is unique, all women seeking an abortion in South Australia will encounter the laws that now constrain the possibilities for medical practitioners and health services to provide them with that best care. These barriers do not necessarily prevent women in our state from seeking abortions. They do, however, place unnecessary limits on their capacity of the doctors and the health prof professionals uh, who seek to provide them with that abortion care. That is why the South Australian Abortion Action Coalition formed three years ago and mounted the case for law reform. They were formed from a basis of medical and legal professionals concerned with these barriers to care that they observed day to day and documented through academic analysis. And at this point, Mr. President, I seek leave to table the document, Abortion in the Shadow of the Criminal Law, the case for South, of South Australia, authored by Mary Heath and Ia Mulligan. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I continue. From those beginnings at the South Australian Abortion Action Coalition, they have grown in number and breadth. And the growing list of supporters now includes, and I note this because the list has grown since I last spoke to this bill, so I update the Council now for the public record, the Aboriginal Health Council of South Australia, the ALP Women's Network, the Australian Clinical Psychology Association, the Australian Greens of South Australia, the Australian Medical Students Association, the Australian Nursery and Midwifery Federation SA branch, the Australian Psychological Society, SA branch, the Australian Society for Psychosocial Obstetrics and Gynaecology, the Australian Women's Health Net Network, Business and Professional Women Adelaide, Children by Choice, Coalition of Women's Domestic Violence Services Incorporated, Emily's List South Australia, Family Planning Alliance Australia, Flinders University Student Association, the Human Rights Law Centre, Mari Stopes Australia, the National Association of Abortion and Pregnancy Options Councillors, the National Council for Single Mothers and Their Children, the Public Health Association of Australia, SA Branch, Reproductive Choice Australia, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the South Australian Council of Social Services, the South Australian Council for Civil Liberties, the South Australian Rainbow Advocacy Alliance, SA Unions, SA Unions Women's Standing Committee, Shine SA, Support After Fetal Diagnosis of Abnormalities SA, the Tabbot Foundation, the Union of Australian Women, the Women's Electoral Lobby, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom SA branch, the Women Lawyers Association South Australia Incorporated, and the Working Women's Centre of South Australia, as well as the YWCA of Australia, uh, formerly the YWCA of Adelaide. Uh, that organisation now amalgamating. These many organisations back this law reform because that 1969 statutory am amendment to the 1935 Act allowed abortion only when the woman had resided in, Australia, in South Australia for some two months. Two doctors determined the abortion necessary on either uh, mental or physical health grounds or for fetal abnormalities and before the woman is 28 weeks pregnant and thereafter only to preserve the woman's health and is performed in a prescribed hospital. Our current law is from another time, a time when abortion was banned in times gone by, much as elsewhere in the world, um, is no longer uh, the framework for this particular law. Back then, when abortion was banned, sometimes it was safe and a lot of the time it was not. Those unable to find a doctor or midwife would have to go secretly to gain an abortion. It was not always a safe option. They often relied on self-inducing with dangerous and unreliable methods, or with patent medicines featuring not so subtle, will cause miscarriage in pregnant women warnings, or using knitting needles, coat hangers, or falls downstairs. 
In fact, in 1930, illegal abortion was listed as a cause of death for some 2,700 women in that year alone in the United States. In fact, the risk of an unsafe abortion continues to stalk women globally. Even now, recent figures from the World Health Organization estimate that nearly half of the 56 million abortions given worldwide every year are unsafe. But banning abortion does not make abortions go away. Women have, who have the means to travel or the desperation to go underground have always found a way. And as was said at last year's Youth Parliament in their debate on a similar bill, you can't ban abortions, you can only ban safe abortions. That is why we reformed this law 50 years ago, and that is why we should now further reform our laws so that our abortions in this state are safe. Safe abortion means abortion is treated as health care publicly provided wherever possible and accessible. Yet we know already that there are delays due to our current laws pushing women further back uh, in their pregnancy. Safe also means protecting and protecting women seeking that health care as well as protecting those who provide that health care. That is why this bill has a 150 metre safe access zone as almost all other states and territories have now included in their laws. And I note on that uh, the recent very welcome announcement made at the ALP National Conference by Bill Shorten uh, to support such safe access zones and indeed to support publicly provided accessible uh, abortions across our nation. Unfortunately, however, we don't provide that safe workplace to those who work uh, here in South Australia. Indeed, uh, as a Pregnancy Advisory Centre staff member commented to me last year when we first uh, introduced this bill, uh, in that instalment of my second reading speech uh, afterwards, she noted that she was grateful because she'd had a quiet day down at the clinic in Woodville as the protesters had been here in Parliament for a change and not outside the Pregnancy Advisory Centre. For that reason, I'm glad protesters are on the steps weekly and are here today. It means that they are not outside the clinic at Woodville and safely far away from the women today that they uh, that, that, that today seek the health care that they deserve and need. Again, giving those hard-working, compassionate and professional staff the break, I imagine they gratefully appreciate. We've come a long way since the time when only women of means were able to access abortion, where backyard butchers preyed upon the vulnerable, and quite rightly that activity needed to be stamped out. But given our once progressive law that was designed to protect women now harms them, and that those who work in, in providing abortion care suffer the harassment of regular protest and threats, we must now move so that abortion not be treated as a crime. In fact, it should be regulated as any other health service. And we certainly, for this to happen, do need informed debates. However, the debate so far, in terms of the public debate, has not necessarily been informed. I, like many others in this place and no doubt in the other place, have received an avalanche of missives and misinformation. There's been murder rhetoric, noting that the Tammy Franks abortion bill is the worst in the Western world, allowing babies to be killed right up to birth for no medical reason. We have open house slaughter of the innocents, noting that this must be not allowed to be hap happen or it would be mass murder. Stay, stating that abortion is the hands that shed innocent blood. Blatant misinformation, such as saying that the bill would allow sex selection abortions to be carried out, and per per pedophiles and sex traffickers to do away with the evidence of the child they fathered and not be convicted of any offence. Other uh, emails and letters uh, stating that uh, uh, this uh, bill would approve a children's holocaust and also betray the values for which, almost, for which every martyr in history fell and, more importantly, the values for which our own Anzac soldiers died defending. That is, the freedom to live. Quoting the J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, character Gandalf when he said, Do not be too eager to sort out matters of life and death, for even the wisest cannot see all ends. This... Um, uh, no doubt was prompted by uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, misinformation that has gone out from more formal so sources, which I will get to soon. Some of the missives have just been odd, noting, please reconsider the bill. I believe some of the provo proposed provisions are as extreme as the Nazi bombing in Sheffield. 
Another stating we should not have a task force to hunt terrorists if we were allowed to do this to our own. There has been a lot of mother blame stating uh, to us, uh, pleading to uh, not support this bill. Such uh, uh, accusations such as hard questions need to be asked and society needs to support these women more so that the life in their womb is not sacrificed to avoid discomfort for them or those around them. Also stating, has life become so cheap that we are to set a precedent that an innocent baby nearly at full term can be exterminated practically at the whim of its mother? Another, I can only imagine the heartache and trauma of women who deliberately choose to end the life of their own flesh and blood, especially through this barbaric act of mutilation and callousness. Hell, Satan and Isis have all been mentioned. Uh, one noting, Miss Frank is in the pagan ancient world. There was always human sacrifice to the false gods, uh, Baal, Ishtar, Isis and Satan. I note Satan spelt with a dollar symbol instead of an S involving children too. The Babylonians, the Incas, Mayas, Miss Frank, abortion is just human sacrifice to Satan, as was done in the ancient, ancient pagan world. All who are against God's commandments, the teaching of Jesus Christ, your Lord, God and Saviour, hell is real and many unsuspecting souls go there. Don't be one of them. For those who end up in the eternal lake of fire, there is no return. Miss Frank's Many will not inherit the kingdom of God. Please consider this satanic late abortion bill. Further calls that this would uh, lead to ritual sacrifice and stating that abortion is just another name for child sacrifice. Um, tragic to see you pushing for child sacrifice, as with pagans three and a half thousand years ago, and pretending you're incorrectly spelt. You're liberating women from their burden with some modern philosophy. Another goes on to say, I've heard my teachers tell me of Aztecs and Incas who sacrificed newborn babies and children to sun gods, and yet this is exactly what would be happening if we were to pass this law. We would be sacrificing the babies to the god of self. And then some personal attacks. Is this woman, Tammy, a mother or an auntie? Oh, the answer is yes uh, to that person, but I won't be writing back to them. Is she despairing that her own mother never aborted her? I must say my mother is a strong supporter of choice and indeed worked at Family Planning Queensland. Back when she had me, of course, there was no uh, choice of a legal abortion um, and uh, certainly her, she and I have had many uh, discussions about how that failed so many women of the time, particularly with the forced adoptions that resulted from them. Uh, some more personal attacks. Um, which I, I won't go into, but uh, being called a murderer on a regular basis, I've got to say, will not deter me because it is not true. The misinformation and fear campaign simply fuels my desire to have this debate in an informed way. Those organisations who have put their name to some of this claptrap should be ashamed of the lies and information that, misinformation that they have spread about, often willingly. Certainly recklessly, recklessly. And with that, Mr President, I seek leave to table the three letters initiated on February the 14th this year from the Catholic Archdiocese of Adelaide. Is leave granted? L leave is granted. In that letter uh, of February the 14th from the Catholic Archdiocese of Adelaide, there uh, is uh, certainly signed off by the Apop Apostolic Administrator Gregory O'Kelly, um, an attachment uh, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Evis Seaman, and uh, a form letter for people uh, to send off to their local MPs. But I know that, that the letter states uh, this bill treats abortion simply as a medical procedure without moral significance. I would agree if they'd said this bill simply treats abortion as a medical procedure. Uh, certainly I disagree that any woman contemplating an abortion does not place some moral significance upon it. However, then it goes on to completely lie and say there is no need for a medical opinion or a doctor's involvement and no reason need be given for an abortion. It will be the most radical abortion law in the country. Totally false to say by taking abortion out of the criminal code and treating it as a health procedure that there will be no medical opinion or doctor's involvement. Indeed, that is the point of this bill, 
that there will be medical opinion and doctors' involvement. Uh, but certainly the uh, letter goes on to uh, advise um, people to send uh, missives that no doubt every, everyone in this place has now received, uh, stating such things as the Franks Bill, um, according to Dr Elvis Seaman, uh, when carefully analysed, as he claims, aims to radically deregulate abortion and outlaw two important things conscientious objection to abortion and the freedom to pray and offer pregnancy support near abortion clinics. The proposed bill removes all the provisions that made backyard abortion illegal in 1969. Abortion can be performed by a non-medical provider using any method and for any reason, including sex selection for social reasons, at any gestation up to term, leaving babies born alive to die and using SA health funding without the accountability of reporting. Imposing a health excess zone, Dr Seaman goes on to say, makes pregnancy support services unlawful within 150 metres, restricts freedom of speech, denies potential support to vulnerable women who are, who are ambivalent or who may have been coerced, and provides excessive powers to police. One would imagine that these excessive powers to police are simply uh, those powers police would be given to ensure that people act lawfully and respect a woman seeking health care. The bill, of course, does not allow babies born alive to be left to die. In my second reading speech, I've also already noted that I actually would continue the public reporting of abortion statistics in this state. My bill does not preclude that. The uh, claim that it will radically deregulate abortion and allow conscientious objection and the freedom to pray are simply wrong. I will not be lectured to by the Catholic Church on issues of abortion or indeed child abuse. Certainly, in particular, not this week. I draw members' attention to the recent revelations that nuns who were raped had the Catholic Church oversee abortions because that rape was conducted by priests and sanctioned by the church. So it seems sometimes abortion is appropriate, but not all times. This bill would ensure that it's the woman's choice and certainly would not sanction rape. I also go on to note a very common misunderstanding uh, that uh, decriminalisation somehow means deregulation. I fear this is something that I may have to say a thousand times in the next six months. Decriminalisation does not mean deregulation. The Marshall government announcement this week that the debate will now be assisted by a reference to the South Australian Law Reform Institute salary is most welcome. Not least because I would back Professor John Williams and his team's understanding of the law any day over many of these making these extraordinary claims about my bill. I am pleased to see the Marshall government allow for some informed insight and reflection to calm the sure voices that are currently claiming all of the space. Sowry, I believe, will report back to the parliament on this area and ensure, as MPs with a conscience vote, as we debate a woman's choice, that our own choices on how we exercise that vote will be better informed as, the pro as we progress to a vote. But before we get to the salary report, which is now some months away, I think now is as good a time as any for a little truth-telling. Contrary to the fear campaign that has been launched in our streets, on our airways, across many churches and even on the back of a truck, as I said, decriminalisation does not mean deregulation. Five simple words and an even simpler concept, but I feel we will have to repeat this ad nauseum as it is being so willfully misunderstood. Healthcare is highly regulated in our nation and will remain so with the Health Practitioner Regulation National Law, SA 2010, the Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act, SA 1995, and the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989, just being three of the most ob obvious of the many relevant statutes that will continue 
to regulate abortion care. Currently, in the case of abortion care, women and their health care teams are constrained in their health care decisions by the Criminal Law Consolidation Act 1935. Repeal of the criminal law in relation to abortion will remove the stigma and the chilling effect of criminality on clinicians and health care organisations. And it will require only minor amendments to existing standards and guidelines for the overwhelming majority of abortions, some 98 per cent of them. Once abortion is removed from the criminal law, it will be regulated according to the normal standards and practices that do govern all other health services. These include specific clinical guidelines for each area of care. All health procedures, practices and services are closely controlled and regulated by government, industry and professional bodies, and breaches are dealt with very seriously. In this way, existing health law, regulations, codes of practice, clinical protocols and institutional policies and procedures provide a comprehensive regulatory framework that protects patients, promotes good quality and safety in health care and ensures accountability. Under these arrangements, women who need abortion care will be afforded the same safe, good quality care as all patients should be able to expect. And to health care professionals, they will be able to deliver that care within a framework of health laws, standards and regulations, not with the criminal law lo looming over their practice. There are some 20 South Australian and about 70 Commonwealth Health Statutes, I remind members. Law and professional practitioner regulatory boards already ensure that only qualified professionals provide health care and that they are held accountable for compliance with standards. Health care is provided in accordance with those specific clinical standards and in appropriate facilities with hospitals and day surgery centres regulated primarily by SA Health. Early medication abortion in the primary care setting is closely regulated under Commonwealth laws and regulations. Patients must, of course, give informed consent for all health care services, and health care providers who fail to secure that informed consent are subject to heavy penalties. Standards and guidelines for the very small number of abortions that would be needed later in pregnancy, less than 2 per cent of all abortions, will likely be revised once the criminal laws are repealed. Revisions will ensure that appropriate clinical decisions are made for these patients who are typically faced with the decision of whether to keep or terminate their pregnancy in distressing and complex situations, such as the diagnosis of fetal abnormality, serious maternal illness or in the context of family violence. Regulation under health law will help to ensure that patients can be treated promptly and that care is affordable. Importantly, health professionals are already not required to provide abortion care if they have a conscientious objection. They are always required to refer patients to others who can provide care. This will not change. Indeed, assaults on a woman that also harm her fetus would still be punishable under the criminal laws of assault. Where coercion is used, that uh, would certainly not have ever been a matter related to sections 81 82 and 82A of our current criminal code. These provisions indeed would be far more likely to punish the victim of that coercion and domestic violence rather than the perpetrator of that violence. And I remind members that there is a life imprisonment penalty associated with some of these clauses. The Health Practitioner Regulation National Law applies in South Australia to all health professionals. The National Law provides for the protection of the public by ensuring that only health protection practitioners who are suitably trained and qualified to practice in a competent and ethical manner are registered. The National Law also in establishes the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency and National Health Practitioner Boards including the Medical Board of Australia, the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Australia, the Pharmacy Board of Australia, the Psychology Board of Australia, among others. These national boards set registration and accreditation requirements, including standards and programs of study, to ensure practitioners are suitably qualified and competent. They also establish mandatory performance and professional standards, as well as policies and guidelines. Each board has extensive investigatory and disciplinary powers, including suspension or withdrawal of registration and maintenance of national registers. The national law also allows for the minister to make further regulations and define offences for unqualified persons practising inappropriately. Health practitioners can be disciplined for misconduct and unsatisfactory professional performance. The national law is administered in South Australia by the South Australian Health Practitioners Tribunal. 
With regard specifically to conscientious objection, health professionals are already not forced to provide care they are not willing to provide, and nothing in this bill will obligate them to assist um, to, to uh, defer from that. They are, however, under the current system, uh, obligated uh, to assist patients to gain access to care. Doctors, nurses and others are, specially, are specifically protected from being required to provide care for which they are not skilled or have a conscientious objection. Protection for conscientious objection is specified in mandatory national codes of conduct, conduct for doctors, nurses and midwives and others, as well as, of course, in the AMA Code of Ethics. Abortion uh, in terms of uh, provision in appropriate facilities will, of course, continue to be in accordance with the relevant clinical guidelines and standards. Surgical abortions are provided in hospitals and day surgery centres. The Healthcare Act 2008 of South Australia governs the incorporation of public hospitals and the licensing of private hospitals and private day procedure centres. SA Health specifies mandatory standards and procedures for these facilities. With regards to early medication abortion care, it is used extensively throughout our country and internationally, and its safety is proven. Following decriminalisation, early medication abor abort uh, abortion care would be provided in primary care, including by telemedicine as well as in outpatient services. Medications for early abortion are regulated under the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989, and this controls the quality, safety, efficacy and timely availability of therapeutic goods. It covers the regulation of manufacture and standards for those therapeutic goods and establishes the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods and creates a criminal offence for importing, supplying or exporting goods that do not comply with these standards. The TGA approval of uh, early medication abortion medicines was issued in 2012 and it speci specifies the conditions under which they can be prescribed, including gestational length, dosage, training requirements, follow-up and access to emergency care and support. Pharmaceutical benefits schedule regulations require that authority is requested from the Commonwealth Department of Human Services for each prescription for early medication abortion. Two large studies of the Australian experience have found that EMA early medication abortion is safe and effective, with the most common complication being incomplete abortion in about 5% of the cases. For that, surgical abortion is the backup procedure. Patients, of course, must give informed consent, and currently all patients must give that informed consent for medical treatment, including for abortion care. This bill does not change that. The potential pro problem of coercion of a woman to terminate a pregnancy is addressed by the informed consent requirement as legislated in the Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act 1995 of South Australia. It aims to ensure that, parent, pa sorry, it aims to ensure that patients decide freely for themselves on an informed basis whether or not to undergo medical treatment of any kind. Medical practitioners are required to explain the nature, consequences and risks of treatment and alternatives. These provisions act to protect patients from coercion by parents, partners and others, because treating health professionals must rule out coercion in order to reach and meet their obligations. The Health and Community Services Complaints Act 2004 enables patients who are not satisfied with any aspect of their care to complain to that Health and Com Community uh, Services Commissioner. Grounds may include that the health practitioner acted unreasonably, inappropriately, without due skill, contrary to applicable standards or in an unprofessional manner. In particular, patients may complain that a health practitioner failed to provide sufficient information to enable, to make them, to enable them to make an informed decision or fail to provide the patient with a reasonable opportunity to make an informed choice concerning treatment and services provided. The Commissioner does have extensive investigative and disciplinary powers. Ensuring proper consent on behalf of minors and other people unable to, unable to give their own consent is also regulated under both the Consent to Medical Treatment and Palliative Care Act 1995 and also the Guardianship and Administration Act 1993. Informed consent must be sought from the parent or guardian. There are some exceptions, but the medical practitioner must satisfy a number of conditions with serious penalties for failure to do so. To do so.
Institutional requirements ensure that abortions later in pregnancy are provided in accordance with those clinical and professional standards, as I've mentioned, and professional ethics and the health professional regulation national law require that all health professionals act in the best interests of their patients and that all health care is provided on the basis of need in the interests of the patient's health, well-being and quality of life and within clinical standards and guidelines. That need is determined by patients and their health care teams. Women facing the question of abortion above 20 weeks are always in distressing and complex situations. About half are confronting a diagnosis of fetal abnormality. A small number face serious maternal illness or injury, and others are in a range of complex social personal circumstances. These in include reproductive coercion and other forms of family vi violence. They include rape, facing pregnancy as children or ve when very young, or experiencing an undiagnosed pregnancy, mental illness or substance abuse. These patients with these complex needs are currently treated in specialised centres by multidisciplinary teams in compliance with institutional protocols and professional standards. This bill would not change that. The current criminal law, however, does cause several problems for patients and their care providers in these situations. Most commonly, the pressure to make a decision quickly because of a looming cut-off time, which varies across services. And certainly one story that I would like to share today is of a friend of mine. And uh, uh, her daughter is a similar age to me, her oldest daughter. And I remember talking to her in the playground uh, when both of our daughters had just started primary school in junior primary. That day, previously, she'd been incredibly happy. She was pregnant and expecting their second child. Seeing her that day, Sandy, my friend, in the playground, in tears, stressed, was not what I'd expected. That day, uh, she uh, had found out that at her 21-week scan, that her now daughter, Tess, had a severe heart condition. The initial prognosis was that the condition was so severe that it was incompatible with life. The doctor's advice was that a late abortion would be the best emotional and health outcome for Sandy and her baby. But as an urgent priority, they needed to get more tests and more scans and gather more information. They then had a terrible realisation. They only had 10 days before the medical professionals would be unable to perform abortion surgery due to the legal uncertainty around abortion care in this state. This position was concerning. All of the doctors were apologetic, but there was this unhelpful and arbitrary deadline to a very traumatic decision. All were clear that the best medical advice would be not to rush a decision, to give Rob and Sandy the time to grieve the situation. They were also clear that the health outcomes for Sandy and her baby would not change between 20 and 23 weeks. The heart diagnosis was essentially fatal and time wouldn't change that. But a week later, new scans and medical technology didn't medically change the outcome. It provided them with vital, clearer information. The part of the heart that had appeared to be missing was transposed located 180 degrees in the wrong place. This changed everything, and the life chances turned from incompatible with life to a serious and challenging heart condition. It was certainly not easy for them from there on in, but that did change everything. They were so relieved and felt it was the best news they could have received. But they were two days away from the date where they would have had to undergo the termination surgery. That arbitrary and unhelpful legal deadline could have caused them to make what have, would, would have been, in this lucky case, an unnecessary, rushed and tragic decision. Prenatal screening is a means to an amazing amount of information for fetal health. We must remove the legal uncertainty so that our medical experts can give the very best care to our community. These instances are, of course, rare. They are definitely traumatic, and the information technology that provides uh, us with this information improves day by day. The law, of course, now, though, is a reverse clock, working against the best medical information being obtained before medical advice is given. And now, six, six years on, 
Young Tess has had two open heart surgeries and so many other procedures. She's brave and strong, and Rob and Sandy love her dearly, and they're so glad that she wasn't lost to them by this unnecessary law, but it was so close that it all, almost took Tess's life. They say that most of all we wish for other parents and doctors that they be able to avoid the trauma of those arbitrary dates in the future and remove abortion from the criminal law. This is the situation for far too many families in our state currently who face that distressing diagnosis of an abnormality in a very much wanted pregnancy and are sometimes required to make a very difficult decision within even as little as 24 hours, a requirement that rules out the further diagnostic assessment that may have enabled them to make a different decision. For some women, access is also denied in Adelaide and they travel interstate or overseas uh, to get the health care they need. Women who aren't able to travel are forced to continue the pregnancy and birth a baby um, that they did not necessarily choose to. And there are immediate consequences for a woman's mental health affecting their capacity to bond with that baby and generally poor outcomes for both women and the child. Critically, leading health bodies, including the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the Royal Australia Australasian College of Physicians and the Public Health Association of Australia do not, I repeat, do not support legislatively prescribed gestational limits that set out different laws for different stages of pregnancy. That is because the health system and health professionals working with individual patients are equipped to make appropriate decisions in the best interests of patients regarding later terminations. Once the criminal law is repealed, amendments will be required to the two existing SA Health clinical standards for abortions that are undertaken later in pregnancy and governing the termination of pregnancy and fetal loss. The corresponding hospital policies and procedures will then be amended accordingly. Regulation in other jurisdictions in Australia and internationally provides potential mod models for amending these standards for South Australia to follow. The standards will then need to guide decision-making about care for each individual patient within a framework of appropriate principle and processes. Health care professionals are never forced to care, provide the care that they are not willing to provide, and uh, certainly uh, the uh, scuttlebutt that has been put out about this bill, uh, taking abortion care out of the realm of doctors and medical professionals and medical opinion is just that. It is absolute rubbish and it belongs in the bin. In terms of uh, uh, the most recent debates, uh, I would uh, reiterate that uh, claims that we've seen in this most recent day or so, uh, that removing abortion from the criminal code will somehow re result in more coerced abortions and increased domestic violence, is uh, mischievous, at the very least, willfully destructive, at the worst. Isn't it time that we stopped punishing victims of domestic violence and rather, leave, uh, rather than leave a, a law in the criminal code that indeed would punish the victim herself of that abortion rather than the perpetrator of violence against her, uh, we should indeed uh, put that uh, political agenda to one side. If people are serious, about addressing issues of domestic violence and coercion, then bring forward legislation to this place to increase our progress in that area. Do not use abortion law reform as a stalking horse uh, with the pretense that you are uh, supporting those who are victims of domestic violence. We've heard a lot of claims so far. Um, and we've heard a lot from those who are not involved in the provision of abortion or indeed later abortion. Someone that I would urge all members to pay heed to, who is a doctor who has performed later abortions for many, many years and has become somewhat of a Twitter sensation, is uh, obstetrician gynaecologist Jennifer, Dr Jennifer Gunter. Incensed by the recent comments of Donald Trump, at the State of Un the Union address, she took to Twitter, and it certainly was an education. At the time, she wrote that she noted only nine states in the District of Columbia about allow abortions after 24 
weeks without restrictions, and that the number of those was incredibly rare, some 0.3 per cent. She went on to state, normally they are only done because the mother is sick or the baby is so deformed it won't live. With a sick mum after 24 weeks, they would normally induce labour and once born, the baby would be in the care of the neonatal intensive care unit to help it survive. She cautioned the general public and especially our political leaders to confuse, not to confuse the abbreviation of term with term meaning a fixed or limited period for which something lasts and indeed stated late term abortion is in fact redundant because termination is the medical word for elective abortion. It should either be late term or late abortion. The only abortion, she went on to state, of an unwanted pregnancy at 37 to 42 weeks of pregnancy is in fact inducing labour, normal birth of a live baby and adoption to new parents. She knows because she has worked in this field for many, many years. She knows because she has had to form, perform these late abortions uh, for a woman whose ultrasound showed anencephaly. Be glad that you do not know this word. I did not know it before now. It means missing most of the brain and part of the skull. The only case that she could think of in her knowledge and experience of many years of work in late term, late, later abortions was that of a 12-year-old girl who was raped by her stepbrother and then dragged through the courts as she sought to gain an abortion. And that court process pushed her into that later abortion framework. That girl was failed by her family, failed by the courts. The doctor was there to provide the abortion health care that she needed. And if you don't think 12-year-olds in this country are raped by stepbrothers, I draw your attention to the young girl in WA who was impregnated uh, by her brother and gave birth in her own lounge room last month. She didn't even know she was pregnant. There are so many stories we have yet to hear in this debate. And so I would urge MPs to start to listen to the quieter voices in this debate, the voices of those people that I imagine none of you would care to walk in the shoes of, those of later abortion patients. In fact, they have started to speak up in America because of that uh, President Trump using the opportunity of the State of the Nation address to divide his country. And in response to his fake news of a so-called nine-month abortion, a signed letter from dozens of Americans, an open letter, was penned. These Americans were from Illinois, Indiana, Idaho, Arizona, Maine, Pennsylvania, Washington, South Dakota, California, Oregon, Michigan, Virginia, Georgia, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Florida, Oklahoma, New Jersey, um, Iowa, Missouri, Colorado, Illinois, Alabama, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Maine, Maryland, New York, Kansas, Missouri and Texas, and they stated, that recent legislation regulating abortion in New York and the further around a similar proposed bill in Virginia have ignited a national conversation around later abortion. They condemned President Trump's words that these were easy decisions and they stated, and I quote, we know because we are the families who have gotten them. We are the later abortion parents and their partners who are concerned with the politicisation of this issue at the expense of both truth and compassion. While we do not speak for every later abortion patient and do not pretend to represent everyone who seeks this care, we can speak for ourselves and our families. The stories we hear being told about later abortion in this national discussion are not our stories. They do not reflect our choices or experiences. These hypothetical patients don't sound like us or the other patients we know. The barbarous, unethical doctors in these scenarios don't sound like the people who gave us compassionate care. Our cases, the ones that would be affected by the legislation in question, constitute a relatively small number of abortions. So while these cases are incredibly rare and specific to each patient's unique circumstances, they are so broadly misrepresented and being played an, an outside role on the national stage. The decision to terminate a pregnancy is never a political one, it is a personal one. Later abortion stories are often ones of tragedy and loss. For others, they are stories of relief. They feature struggles with hope, women betrayed by their bodies, and the incredible complexity of pregnancy. 
Many stories are ones of overcoming the many obstacles and restrictions our states have placed on these procedures. We are not monsters. We are your family, your neighbours, someone you love. We are you, just in different circumstances. Due to ignorance, many of us may not have supported later abortion access before having a crisis ourselves. Accepting restrictions on health care we never imagined needing. Now we recognise that our laws may not be able to draw neat lines around each of our stories, allowing these procedures in certain hyper-specific circumstances and not in others, because we know people will be left outside those lines. As people privileged enough to speak up, that is unacceptable to us. I applaud their courage for speaking up, and they all put their names to that letter, not just their locations. And I repeat, it has stuck with me, their words and how they must be feeling, having already suffered such devastating circumstances and loss. They state, we are not monsters. We are your family, your neighbours, someone you love. We are you, just in different circumstances. None of us here would want to be them but all of us here should be willing to support them. To do that, we must start having a more nuanced conversation about later abortion that reflects the experiences of patients and the expertise of physicians. We need to start listening to people with that first-hand experience. They will tell you their stories if you can muster the compassion necessary to hear them. Talking about later abortion is uncomfortable. It requires us confronting the terrible reality that pregnancy, even the most wanted one, is not always blessed. It means we have to consider decisions being made with imperfect information. When we talk about later abortion, concepts we thought were simple become very complicated. Therefore, we must weigh the restrictions on later abortion against real stories, not the hypothetical cases that are fabricated to win political points. While there's manufactured crises over later abortion, opportunistic politicians will seek to exploit an already stigmatised, marginalised group of people. Over and above the loss of those much wanted pregnancies, they will suffer also with the loss of their dignity, reduced to demons and denied their voice. There must be space in this debate for education and empathy. But this is only possible if it includes the stories of real patients. Real women, not mythical ones, must guide this one, this debate. Real women, not mythical women, must guide this debate. Placing trust in women to control their own health with compassion and understanding, not with stigma, assumption and impugned motives, and having a good faith effort at a conversation on later abortion that includes them. Abortion stigma, however, runs very deep in this debate and it is running very deep right now in this state. That is why today I will also include the voices of some of those who have experienced later abortion in this conversation. Listen now to the voice of Kate Carson. I had a later abortion because I couldn't give my baby girl both life and peace. No one loves my baby more than I do. Her death was a gift of mercy. Now women like me will always be a scapegoat for policies limiting women's rights. People are talking about me again, loudly, unkindly. Even the President of the United States has had his say about families like mine. I have told this story so many times, but I will tell it again as many times as it takes. I help run a support group for families who have ended pregnancy after poor prenatal or maternal diagnoses. And if you're wondering, who are these women who get abortions in the third trimester? We are, I am, parents who love our babies with our entire hearts. Desperate acts like an abortion in the 36th week of pregnancy are brought about only by the most desperate circumstances and are only available uh, to those uh, in certain limited uh, situations. I know I've been there. My daughter Laurel was diagnosed in May 2012 with catastrophic brain malformations, including Dandy Walker malformation. This was overlooked until the 35th week of my pregnancy. I did not know much about brain disorders at that point. I imagined developmental delay, special education classes, financial pressure, an overhaul of expectation for Laurel's life and my motherhood. Here were the doctor's real expectations for Laurel. A brief life of seizures, full body muscle cramps and aspirating her own bodily fluids. When I heard the list of all the things that my beloved daughter would not do, she would not talk, walk, hold her head up, swallow, I grasped for what she would be able to do. 
Do children like mine just sleep all the time? I asked. The neurologist winced. Children like yours, he told me, slowly, are not often comfortable enough to sleep. Our choice was sad but clear. Let me answer some questions you might be thinking. Yes, we were sure that these problems were severe. No, there is no cure nor any on the horizon. Yes, we were counselled in depth on our options, including adoption. Because we wanted to spare our daughter as much suffering as possible, our choice was very sad but crystal clear, abortion. I imagined an abortion at eight months would be grisly, but no matter how violent my imagination, it surely could not compare with the suffering Laurel would have endured in her own broken body. In Massachusetts, my home state, a later abortion can be obtained only if the life or health of the mother is at risk. So I set off on a 2,000 mile journey from Massachusetts to Colorado to access this abortion. I landed not in the nightmare I had imagined, but in the safest, kindest, most dignified hands I have ever encountered as a patient anywhere. Dr. Warren Hearn at his Boulder Abortion Clinic is one of the few doctors in the country performing this procedure. After a single injection and a couple of hours, my baby was laid to rest in my womb, the purest mercy that I knew how to give Laurel. Mercy means something different to every family. Nobody loves Laurel more than I do. Her death was a gift of mercy. Mercy means different things to different loving families, and that has to be okay. To all the families who faced similar circumstances and made a different choice, I honour you. I trust your wisdom. I celebrate your child's brief and beautiful life. We must treat each other with love, tenderness and respect. It is horrible as a parent to choose between life and peace for our children, especially when we want to give our children both beautiful and precious gifts. It is devastating to lose a child, but unlike most bereaved parents, women like me will live out the rest of our lives as scapegoats, fuel for an agenda that seeks to strip women and, our, and their families of our reproductive freedoms. When I think of my baby Laurel, I feel love and peace. Unfortunately, I cannot be that peace because there are fresh, fresh roots because there are fresh wounds in the way, the throbbing pain of being hated and misunderstood. Gretchen Voss has also shared her late-term abortion sto story, which started so happily, as so many do. Way too excited to sleep on that frigid April morning, I snuggled my bloated belly up to my husband, Dave. 18 weeks pregnant today, we would finally have our full fetal ultrasound and find out whether our baby was a boy or a girl. I had no reason to be nervous. I thought I was young, if 31 is the new 21, healthy and had not had so much as a twinge of nausea. Well into my second trimester, I was past the point of worrying about a miscarriage. The past three and a half months had been a time of pure bliss, dreaming about our future family, squirrelling away any extra money that we could and cleaning out a room for a nursery in our cosy suburban home, then borrowing unholy amounts of stuff to fill it back up. From that day, we found, ourselves, we found, from that day we found out that we were expecting a baby. New Year's Eve 2002. We had thought of ourselves as parents and finding out whether it would be a he or a she would cap the months of scattershot emotions and frenetic, frenetic information gathering. I just couldn't sleep. I invited our 105-pound yellow Labrador puppy into the bed with us and snuggled even closer to Dave. Later that morning, at quarter past nine, Dave held my hand as I lay on the cushy examining table at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Centre office in Lexington. As images of our baby filled the black screen, we oohed and aahed like the goofy expectant parents that we were. Can you tell if it's a boy or a girl? I must have asked a million times. The technician was non-committal, stoic, and I started to feel uncomfortable. Where was all the bubbly chit-chat? She was all furrow-browed concentration. Then using an excuse about finishing something on her previous ultrasound, she left the room. Seconds passed into minutes while we waited for her to return. Staring at the pictures of fuzzy kittens and kissing dolphins on the ceiling, I knew something was wrong. Dave tried to reassure me, but when the ultrasound technician told us that our doctor wanted to see us, I started to shake. But she doesn't even know we're here, I said to her, and then to Dave, over and over. That's when I started crying and I could barely get my clothes back on. The waiting room upstairs, usually full of happy pregnant women devouring parenting magazines, was empty. Our doctor, who usually wears a smile below his, her chestnut hair, met us at the front desk. 
She was not smiling that day, and she led us back to her cramped office full of framed photos of her own children. As we sat there, she said that the ultrasound indicated that the fetus had an open neural tube defect, meaning that the spinal column had not closed properly. It was a term I remembered skipping right over in my pregnancy book, along with all those other fetal an anomalies and birth defects that I thought referred to other people's babies, not mine. She couldn't tell us much more. We would have to go to the main hospital in Boston, which has a more high-tech machine and a more highly trained technician. She tried to be hopeful. There was a ra wide range of severity with these defects, she said, and then she left us to cry. We drove into Boston in near silence, tears rolling down my cheeks. There was no joking or chatting at the hospital in Boston, no fuzzy, fuzzy kittens or kissing dolphins on the ceiling of that clinical, chilly room. Dave held my hand more tightly than before. I couldn't bear to look at this screen. Instead, I studied the technician's face like a nervous flyer taking her cues from the expression a stewardess wears. Her face revealed nothing. She squirted cold jelly on my belly and then slid an even colder probe back and forth around my belly button, pinching it down every so often to make the baby move for a better view. She didn't say one word in 45 minutes. When she finished, she looked at us and confirmed our worst fears. Instead of cinnamon and spice, our chi child came with technical terms like hydrocephalus and spina bifida. That's the spine, she said, had not closed properly, and because of the location of the opening, it was as bad as it got. What they knew, that the baby would certainly be paralysed and incontinent, that the baby's brain was being tugged against the opening in the base of the skull, and that the cranium was full of fluid, was awful. What they didn't know, whether the baby would live at all, and if so, in what sort of mental, with, with what sort of mental and developmental defects, was devastating. Countless surgeries would be required if the baby did live. None of them would repair the damage that was already done. I collapsed into Dave. It sounds so utterly naive now, but nobody told me that this pregnancy was a gamble, not a guarantee. Nobody told me what was rooting around inside me was a hope, not a promise. And I remember thinking what a cruel joke these last months had been. We met with a genetic counsellor, but given the known as well as the unknown, we both knew what we needed to do. Though the baby might live, it was not a life that we would choose for our child, a child that we already loved. We decided to terminate the pregnancy. It was our last parental decision. So this is our story, mine, my husband's and our baby's. It is not a story I ever thought I'd share with a mass audience because frankly, it's nobody's business, but now it is. The reason it is because we've been lost in the political slugfest and have the very real experiences of women and their families who uh, face this heartbreaking decision every day are not heard. I don't know what was worse, those three days leading up to the procedure, I have never called it an abortion, or every day since. I clung to Dave, he was always the rock in our relationship, but now I became completely dependent on him for my own sanity. Though abortion had never been part of his consciousness, he was resolved in a way that my hormones or female nature or whatever it wouldn't let me be. But I worried about him too. The only time I saw him crack was after his brother, his best friend, left a tearful message on our answering machine. Then I found Dave kneeling on the floor in our bathroom, doubled over and bawling, his body quaking, and that nearly killed me. I don't remember much from those three days. Walking around with a belly full of broken dreams, it felt like what I would imagine drowning feels like flailing and suffocating and desperate, semi-conscious, conscious. surrounded by our family, I found myself t tortured by our decision, asking over and over, are we doing the right thing? That was the hardest part. Even though I finally understood that pregnancy wasn't a gerber commercial, that bringing forth life wasn't intimately, was intimately wrapped up in death, what with miscarriage and stillbirth, this was actually a choice. Everyone said, of course, it's the right thing to do. Even my Catholic father, and my Republican father-in-law, neither of whom was even pro-choice. Because suddenly, for them, it wasn't about religious doctrine or political platforms. It was personal. Their son, their daughter, their grandchild. It was flesh and blood as opposed to abstract ideology, and that changed everything. I was surprised to find out that I would no longer be in the care of my obstetrician, the woman who had been my doctor through my pregnancy, and it turned out that she only dealt with healthy pregnancies. Now that mine had gone horribly wrong, she set up an appointment for me with someone else, the only person who was willing to take care of me. 
Now, I felt like an outcast. As we drove to his private office, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were going to meet my executioner. I had never met this doctor, but I did look him up online. With thick, mad scientist-like glasses, he looked scary. In person, though, he reminded me, both in looks and the manner, of Dr Larch in the Cider House Rules. He had the kindest, saddest eyes I have ever seen, and he sat with us for at least an hour, speaking to us with heartfelt compassion and understanding that I had never an understanding that I had never encountered from any doctor before. His own eyes teared as Dave and I cried. He explained the procedure to us, at least the parts we needed to understand. Unlike a simple first trimester abortion, which can be completed in one quick office visit, a second trimester of termination is much more complicated, a two-day minimum process. He started it that day by inserting four laminaria sticks made of dried seaweed into my cervix. It was excruciating, and he apologised over and over as I cried out in pain. When I left the examining room, my mum and my husband were shocked. I was shaking and ghostly white. The pain lasted through the night as the sticks collected my body's fluids and expanded, dilating my cervix just like the beginning stages of labour. The next morning, Dave and my mother took me to the hospital in Boston. I was petrified. I'd never had any sort of surgery, and I fought the anaesthesia, clinging to the final moments of being pregnant. As I lay in that stark white room and I started to drift off, my doctor held one of my hands and an older female nurse held the other. Whispering in my ear, you're going to be okay. I've been here before. Lean on your husband. It was my last memory and when I woke, it was all over. Dave had to return to work the next day. He didn't want to leave me and he certainly didn't want to return into the furtive stares of his co-workers, all of whom knew we had, quote, lost the baby. I really don't know how he did it. My mother stayed with me at home for the next week, trying to glue my shattered pieces back together with grilled cheese sandwiches and chicken noodle soup. I had no control over my emotions. I felt like a freak in a world of capable women having babies, and I couldn't stop whimpering. Why did my body betray me? For months I hid from the world, avoiding social outings and weddings. I just couldn't bear well-meaning friends saying, I'm so sorry. So I quarantined myself and would try to go about my day, but then bam, heartbreak would come screaming out of the shadows, blindsiding me and leaving me crumpled on the floor of our house. It wasn't that I was questioning our decision. I knew that we did it out of love, out of all of the feeling in the world, but I still hated it, hated it. The doctor who performed my termination talks about the women he has helped through the years. The pregnant woman who was diagnosed with metatastic melanoma and needed immediate chemotherapy. The woman who was carrying conjoined twins that had only one set of lungs and only one heart. The woman whose baby had a three-chambered heart and would never live. I wrote my doctor a long thank you note on my good wedding stationery. I thanked him for his compassion and his kindness. I wrote that it must be hard what he does, but that I hoped he found consolation in the fact that he was helping vulnerable women in the most vulnerable times of their lives. He keeps my note, along with all the others he's received, in a really large bundle. And he keeps that bundle right next to the stack of hate mail he also receives. They are about the same size. Listen now to those from the medical profession. Aforementioned, Dr Jennifer Gunter is an obstetrician, gynaecologist and a pain medicine physician. She is the author of a book, The Preemie Primer, a guide for parents of premature babies, and her website is and I refer all members to visit this, drjengunter.wordpress.com. And she is, of course, on Twitter, at drjengunter. You may know her as the doctor who recently schooled Donald Trump. She starts with, Dear Donald Trump, I'm an ob gyne. There are no nine-month abortions. She then continues, with I'm a doctor who was trained to do late-term abortions, I did them for five years in residency and for ten years in practice, and I have no idea what Trump is talking about. I have even practiced in states with no gestational age limits for abortions. So while I no longer perform abortions, I know much more about this subject than Donald Trump or any of his advisers can ever hope to know. Focusing on late-term abortions is always an interesting strategy, and certainly if one really wanted to reduce abortion, it is the wrong strategy as only 1.3 per cent of abortions happen 
at or after 21 weeks. We know this because the Centres for Disease Control conducts annual abortion surveillance. The majority of abortions, 91 per cent in fact, happen before 13 weeks. And we know how to prevent them. Easily accessible, free, long-acting, reversible contraception. But since we can't count on Trump, or I certainly today I would add the Catholic Church, for facts about abortion, let's set the record straight on later abortion, meaning those uh, after or on or after about 21 weeks. This is according to Dr Gunter. There are three reasons women seek later abortions. Health of the mother, personal reasons and fetal anomalies or birth defects. Late abortions are rare and women tend to seek them for those three reasons. Abortions for the health of the mother only happen before 24 weeks, which is generally the accepted cutoff for fetal viability. After 24 weeks, if a pregnant person is sick enough that she needs to deliver for her health, obstetricians either induce labour or perform a C-section, and the baby is attended by the neonatal intensive care unit. Anti-abortions would apparently have you believe, and perhaps he believes himself, that in these situations doctors do a delivery and then commit infanticide. Health of the mother abortions absolutely do happen in circumstances of ruptured membranes with an infection or deteriorating heart disease, for example, but they happen before 24 weeks. No obgyne is doing third trimester abortions for the health of the mother. We simply practice obstetrics and deliver the baby by the most appropriate methods. A small percentage of late-term abortions, i.e. at or after 21 weeks, are for personal reasons. These procedures also don't happen in the, quote, nine months nine months or one or two days from delivery. When a woman presents for an abortion, she is past 24 weeks, she is told she is far too long, too far along for that procedure. There is even a medical term for this, Dr Gunter goes on to say, turnaways. And I note at this point there is also a report on those turnaways available via the University of California uh, advancing new standards in reproductive health uh, online. Sadly, however, this debate hasn't listened to the doctors and it hasn't listened to the patients. I hope that the salary reference will allow some much needed sense and facts to be brought into this debate. But we do need, I think, also the compassion and the willingness to be open to have those facts and those stories guide our decisions. To not come back to this place with another blunt tool based more on politics and than on the personal experiences of those who seek health care. And indeed, uh, it is possible for people to change their minds on this issue. And I will finish with one final story. That is the story of Dr. Parker. Dr. Parker uh, in America is uh, a Christian. He's from Birmingham, Alabama, and he initially refused to even consider doing the procedures of abortion. But about halfway through his 20-year career, he changed his mind. And now he's one of the rare doctors who is willing to push the limits and provide abortions at 24 weeks of pregnancy. He wrestled with the morality of it. He'd grown up in the South with fundamentalist Protestantism and was taught that abortion is wrong. And yet he pursued his career as an obstetrician gynaecologist. And there he saw the real and heartbreaking dilemmas that women found themselves in. He found he could no longer weigh the life of a pre-viable or lethally flawed, flawed fetus equally with the life of the woman sitting before him. In listening to a sermon by Dr Martin Luther King, he came to a deeper understanding of his spirituality, which places a higher value on compassion. King asked, what made the Good Samaritan good is that instead of focusing on what would happen to him by stopping to help the traveller, he was more concerned by what would happen to the traveller if he didn't stop to help. With that, he stated, I became more concerned about what would happen to these women if I, as an obstetrician, did not help them. They lack access to health care or they don't have an understanding of their body changes and often figure out later on that they're pregnant or they find out early enough that they're pregnant but their lack of access to health care or volatile, dysfunctional relationships delay them seeking help. The women most likely to be in these situations are trapped in poverty. They are often women of colour or poor socioeconomic backgrounds, less education and women and girls at the extremes of reproductive age. Women beyond that age where they think they can become pregnant or young girls 
who have infrequent and irregular sexual activity and aren't conscious of it. Starting with those women as the one, ones that you would cut off is kind of ironic because they have the most compelling reasons to consider abortion in the first place. The reality is that unplanned, unwanted pregnancies occur to women in all walks of life and in all demographics. One in three women will terminate a pregnancy in her lifetime. The doctor goes on to note he had a patient who was a 32-year-old attorney, a senior star for a prominent US senator. She and her husband had their first pregnancy and were very excited about it, only to find out in the 21st week that there was a lethal, severe developmental abnormality. They waited until the 23rd week because it was a rare disorder and they didn't want to have an abortion unless that rare condition was absolutely confirmed. Another patient was a 13-year-old girl with a very quiet demeanour which her parents had perceived as model behaviour. But in fact, she had an uncle who was staying with the family who had been sexually molesting her, and she kept quiet about it. It only came to light after he left. Dr Parker is a lesson in education, empathy and understanding. These examples he has cited are typical circumstances for later abortions. Doctors do not deliver babies, then kill them. The, the, the central conceit behind that claim is that women will somehow seek out late-term abortions for cavalier reasons and that doctors will perform them with the indulgence of craven politicians. It is the stuff of fantasy and it shows distrust of both women and our medical system. So many stories, such as those of Lindsay Paradiso of Virginia, who discovered that her fetus had a severe abnormality that was almost certainly lethal, but didn't want to abort until it was absolutely confirmed. But then, because she waited, hers was a later abortion. But can you blame her? Or Dala Barrar of Texas, who was devastated to learn that one of the twin girls she was carrying had a neural tube defect and brain matter was being leached out. That meant that she would be severely disabled if she wasn't a vegetable, ending half the pregnancy uh, of that one of the twin girls meant that the other baby had a better prognosis. These choices are heartbreaking. But Daniel Deva had no choice at all. The Nebraska woman was for forced to watch her baby choke to death moments after giving birth because of a strict law in her state that banned abortions after 20 weeks. If her doctor had been allowed to induce labour and analyse her condition earlier, she would have learned something that would have helped her have a future healthy birth. Instead, she had to wait out a worsening infection, go through a painful delivery, and then the agony of her baby's death. Another woman facing an unmistakable diag prognosis might not want her baby to suffer and then die or live in that vegetative state. And what sense did, did it make to put her own health at risk or that of the twin fetus? These are the situations that we were talking about when we talk about these supposedly wanton women who will simply seek abortion on demand. These are the most heartbreaking stories that you will hear in this place. And yet they are such a small number and they are so often silenced and we must stop using them as political pawns and listen to the realities of their experiences. If we want to prevent late-term abortions, the answer is indeed to provide early, affordable, safe access to abortion wherever possible, along with easy access to contraception, but also to ensure that our laws are not a blunt tool that puts those families in the most precarious and difficult positions with those terrible choices, with the reverse clock um, that we currently have, with the unrealistic uh, boxes that we will place them in, and we must let women and their doctors handle it. I respect the fact that they are actually going to be more concerned about that fetus than any politician in this place will ever be, than any priest will ever be, and unless it is our body, recognise that it is not our choice. Like Dr Potter, you might even find that you change your mind when you not only trust women, but you listen to their voices. This is a South Australian Abortion Action Coalition bill, not a Greens bill, as I've stated. But as a Greens member of this place, I am proud to bring it forward. I'm proud that my party has the courage to take on this debate. Uh, and uh, certainly, I look forward to more members of this place having the courage to listen to the true stories, not to the rhetoric and not to the rubbish that we see put into our letterboxes in the dead of night without any uh, authors, but indeed to start 
ensuring that this debate is informed by that compassion and understanding and that we move uh, from the shrill voices that have so far dominated the debate. Uh, with those words, I commend the bill. Yeah.